Well, uh, good morning here in London uh, to everyone on this FS Club webinar. I'm absolutely delighted to have a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Robert Haircock, uh, speaking today on transforming the post-pandemic world. Uh, we've got quite a few people online today, uh, and please, uh, these sessions, as you know, are quite participative. So do get your questions and comments in early. Uh, now, you'll know me, Michael Mainelli. I'm the executive chairman of Zien. And it is truly a delight to be able to introduce these uh, uh, these uh, webinars and also to chair them. And the reason really is that our sponsors listed here are enormously uh, tolerant and allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, uh, finance, uh, and many other social purposes. And Robert today is going to be speaking, I think, uh, very much uh, about things of importance to us. How are we going to go about rebuilding some of the macroeconomics in our society, and particularly uh, with respect to our cities. Now, my job, as ever, is to get out of your way uh, so that you can listen to the expert here. Uh, Robert will be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes. Hopefully that gives us at least 15 and maybe uh, 20 minutes for questions and comments. And I'm looking forward to a very interactive session. Uh, please do uh, use the GoToWebinar question facility to send me any questions and I'll feed them uh, into the discussion. Robert, uh, with no more ado, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. A pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so a little introduction. Um, I've had long-standing interests in a wide-ranging set of areas, complex systems, in particular artificial intelligence, robotics. Um, and I've tried to apply these over the past 25 years in driving innovation. So what I'm going to talk about is really um, a range of different topics, scale, how we ge generate innovation, uh, where does innovation come from, the role of education, how important education is and the diversity of education required, and the diversity of economic structures. So if you go to the first slide, please, Michael. I think it's useful to stand back, um, to look at the Earth from space in this context. Um, where are we? There's obviously great heated debate at the moment, how we regenerate society, regenerate the economy, increase productivity. But if you actually look at the Earth from space, what you're really seeing is urban structures. You're not really seeing companies. You know, the, the, the foundation of human existence is centered on our urban city, town, village, communication links. This is what matters. And these are things that endure. You go to the next slide, please, Michael. So what's important is scale. So for example, if we look at the work by Professor Jeffrey West, uh, one of my favorite authors, he produced this recent book called Scale, Universal Laws of Life and Death in Organisms, Cities and Companies, a great book, I highly recommend it. And he, ex in accessible language, he explains how there's a deep science behind how cities and human settlements have scaled, and also companies. So if you think about companies, many of them only live less than 10 years, two or three years for startups. Large corporates, it's about four decades. So a company that hits 100 years has done extremely well statistically. And yet, if we look at the cities of London, Paris, Rome, Beijing, many other cities, they've been around for millennia, thousands of years. The problem comes in a lot of economic thinking. We focus exclusively on companies. We don't really think in terms of the time duration that those companies are going to exist for. So what matters is the ecosystem, the environment in which we're trying to construct new companies and new innovations on new economic systems, let's think about what is actually going to be there a thousand years from now. Let's think very long term. You know, we tend to be locked into three, five year economic cycles, politically driven. Let's actually think long term. Let's think centuries, millennia, because that will challenge the way we approach these problems. Here's the next slide, please, Michael. So my argument is that we should be thinking in terms of cities, not companies, especially post COVID. We have the opportunity. It's a historical point in time where we could retransform the way we do things. Prosperous cities and towns are going to be the real engines of economic growth and economic development, more so than you know, very in vogue digital giants or even well established companies, Mercedes, G, BP, these kind of companies. Because to think about it, those companies and most like them will be historical entities within a single human lifespan, less than 120 years. Those would be the exceptions. Next slide, please, Michael.
Right. One of the themes I'm going to use throughout the talk is rocket science. We start off with a nice space image. My next metaphor is rockets. Um, well done, SpaceX, the recent uh, first commercial launch of two astronauts into space. That was a fantastic achievement. Um, and a great example of what private venture can do in a what was previously a government-owned domain. Um, if we compare whole economies to the process of engine design for rockets, a rocket needs fuel and oxygen. Economically, we need resources, labor, and capital to drive this economic cycle. Most importantly, you also need something to spark the cycle and innovation. If you just put the fuel and oxygen together, it'll sit there quite stably for a long time. Um, and if you look at most countries, that you actually generally have some mixture of both capital and labor in any given economy. <clears throat> if an economy is failing, what's missing is the level of innovation. Um, I'll come on to how we measure that later on in terms of patents and publications and other measures. So the question now becomes, where do we get that innovation from? What is the real source of innovation? Um, and this is a perennial question that's been around for a long time. We've been trying to address it for centuries now. Can you go to the next slide, please, Michael? Two of my favorite places where I think there's some strong examples of innovation are the MIT Media Labs and the Santa Fe Institute. So in particular, I've referenced some work by Professor Cesar Hidalgo, uh, whose work I'll cite across this presentation. Um, Cesar's done some brilliant work on how networks shape econ economic systems and the productivity of nations and regions. His TED Talks are a, a great starting point for this area. And that work intersects with the work by Jeffrey West on the evolution of cities and this particular urban economic models within them. Um, so we, we now have the beginning of a scientific data-driven approach to understanding how innovation, how economic systems can grow and what are the real sources of innovation. Next slide, please. Michael. Michael's going to get bored of saying, me saying that. Right, let's, from space, let's drill right down to the micro scale. Let's get specific. Where do we get innovation? One of my favorite examples is garages. So <clears throat> if you read The Economist and many of the modern papers, you'll see lots of work citing how companies like HP, Dell, IBM, Google, Amazon, Apple to an extent, <clears throat> all started in garages in the United States. Uh, I, I like this picture because it encapsulates where this innovation came from. This is a typical suburban garage in somewhere in the United States, circa 1965 and the problem that we'll come on to. And why do you put a, a startup in a garage like this? Because it's got power, a concrete floor, it's a good stable structure, it's got coffee on tap, probably bathrooms, it might connect to your property or a friend's property, or you're renting it dirt cheap from somebody. Um, it's a very low cost, stable, accessible way of getting a business running. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So what is this process of inventing in a garage? There's a lovely quote by Jeff Bezos around 98. He said, I know why people move out of garages. It's not because they ran out of room. It's because they ran out of electric power. They have so many computers in the garage. They, they flip the circuit brakes in the house. You can't plug anything else in the house without tripping your circuit breakers. Um, a side note is, uh, as a young man in my family, we were running a home business and I actually helped build a large workshop garage using scrap metal and we had minimal electric power and indeed we did burn out the cable the domestic cabling in the house and nearly set fire to the house so if you are running a business from a garage please be aware of the power requirements but we have a problem that world of garages in suburban america is a no longer available to many in the shrinking social economic space of the u.s and completely lacking from most urban areas in the rest of the world certainly in the UK or many parts of Europe. Garages are far smaller, most people don't have one. That space is just not available. And yet this is one of the primary ways in which a lot of the major digital companies that we see around the world now got started. So the question then becomes, well, what, how do we replace that? What can policymakers, what can city planners do to replace that missing capability? Thanks, Michael. So if you're running a city or a state and you want your company, so Generally speaking, most states want lots of new companies to form. You want the employment that generates. But innovators need this cheap, accessible space in which to invent, tinker, and build. By cheap, ideally free. Most of those garages are operating at zero, almost zero cost. And don't try applying a commercial tax. The other reason 
people that use garages in that way is because they weren't being commercially taxed in general. Um, if you try and rent, rent a small space and you can do the equivalent, you're going to get taxed. Um, this is a real problem. I have friends running small startups in software houses in, in Oxford, for example, paying five, six hundred pounds a week for a commercial rent. This is half their income gone. This is not the way to grow comp companies that needs, uh, they're burning through valuable seed funding. Um, other spaces, for example, in the US, like make spaces are one good way of trying to get around this problem, but even those are quite limited. Another nice example is historic. Let's look at back in time. Where did people do innovation before? How did we mix business thinking and entrepreneurs and engineers in the past? In the Enlightenment, the short answer was coffee houses in 17th century Europe and America. Um, these were the Starbucks of the day. They enabled entrepreneurs, business people, inventors to mix, socialize, and get their postal mail, which was the email of the time, of course, quite novel. Um, we have coffee chains now. They're not really fulfilling the same function. They tend to be small, sterile spaces. So if you're planning your urban regeneration, your urban systems, how do you mix something that gives the equivalent of garage space capability, this social function, uh, the coffee house, and artistic and maker space uh, options? We need to get far more innovative in the way we plan for innovation instead of just leaving it to chance. Next slide, please, Mark. Right. Clusters. This is one of the first things that will come up in any discussion about how to stimulate innovation. And it's this is the number one Christmas wish list for most countries. Let's create a cluster. Let's have more clusters. Let's create technology clusters. Let's have innovation clusters. <clears throat> most recent research shows that it's very difficult to build a cluster from scratch to say this underdeveloped region will now be a cluster and it will become this. It generally doesn't work. So the work by Professor West, if you get his book on scaling laws, shows that clusters like, for example, Cambridge in the UK, Boston in the US, they've been innovative centers for a long time, not just decades, but centuries typically. Um, so that like any cluster center must be genuinely attractive, usually with one or more dynamic universities. Um, and if the counter is true, if people have been vacating a region for a long time period, it's going to be very hard to stimulate that into a cluster. There are many complex factors that go into building a functioning innovation cluster. <clears throat> and it's, we're just beginning to understand what those factors are. <clears throat> the point I'll talk about in a little more detail is diversity and complexity. So Cesar came up with this uh, one process he calls economic complexity index. So if you combine a lot of the key statistical uh, measures of a functioning economy, number of patents produced, number of papers, technical papers produced, um, level of transparency and governance, and all the other economic factors, you can start to build a single parameter that Cesar defines as uh, economic complexity as an index scale in this case from uh, low one is high diversity, 100 is low diversity. And we'll show that in a graph in a second. But the point is, this is a data-driven approach to understanding how innovation is actually operating and what the impact will be on your GDP or your level of uh, wealth. Go to the next slide, please, Michael. Right. First of all, apologies. This is a very filtered graph, and feel free to criticize it in the questions afterwards. So first of all, it's a subset of countries from the ASEAN region plus a few Western states. And here I was simply beginning to experiment with, if we look at the level of economic complexity versus GDP, or mean income in this case. Typically, you get a power law distribution. If you throw in more countries, especially resource intensive countries, this skews the distribution to more like a log normal distribution. For example, Australia has a high GDP, relatively low CI measure because it's primarily a raw goods producer, exporting coal, metal ores, etc. But in general, if you ex filter out those sort of resource intensive states and look at uh, other states, you get something like a power or log, log normal distribution. The key point here is that a state, for example, like Malaysia at the bottom corner, near the inflection point, has the potential to make rapid economic progress with small changes in the ECI rating, the economic complexity index. So this is a highly non-linear function. So we're cl there's clearly a transition point where below an ECI rating of about 20, states are, str are going to struggle with shifting their GDP. Whereas if you can move your 
uh, complexity level past that, below that point on this scale, you have the potential to rapidly improve your GDP or the level of wealth or meaning income in a state. Next slide, please, Michael. Right, on to one of my favorite topics, um, steam engines. So often I've, I've sat in many policy meetings and the first thing that comes up is we want innovation, we want to stimulate the economy, therefore we need STEM graduates, STEM. We need science, technology, engineering, mathematics. These are the skills we require, which is true. There's always, and there's always a shortage of STEM graduates, you can never get enough. But what you really need are STEAM graduates. Science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics. Arts and craft training need to be embedded within your traditional STEM syllabus. If you want to get to a level of innovation, productivity desired by society. Sometimes people pay lip service to this idea, but no one seems to really want to buy into it. And this is transformative. Uh, trust me. The epitome of this would be the uh, steam genius in the 20th century, someone called Buckminster Fuller. If you, not everyone's heard of him. If you haven't, please go to the, that website, look at his life, his history. This is a true maverick thinker. Um, so the geodesic dome that you sometimes see in uh, cities or structures is one of his inventions. He had many interesting inventions, a lot of which failed and weren't commercially successful. All he were left was a great legacy that if you often go to a, you know, the home of any designer or graphic designer or artist or thinker in this kind of space, you'll see his textbooks on the shelf. People are inspired by him. It's a great example of the, this kind of novel thinking. Here's a nice quote from him. When I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty. But when I've finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it is wrong. So here we see someone who's a great engineer speaking in terms of aesthetic, the design, the beauty of something. Why is he doing this? Here's a nice test. If you want to take away from the talk, here's a little trick you can do. Next time you go to visit a university or an industrial center or in a laboratory somewhere, a truly innovative space should be partially me disordered, messy, complex, and has non-obvious items inside it. If it's a pristine laboratory, if it's spotless, if there's no sign of entropy, it's fake. It's not doing its job. So an example I could give is, um, I have an idea for any kind of airship. I need to set fire to things to test this airship idea. Yet if you put that as a business model to people, they'll go, you want to burn some, you know, set fire to things and burn money basically to test an hypothesis. Entropy is an intrinsic form of creation. Um, and I'll come on to a point in a minute about, there's a, we have a, the fundamental problem is a split mindset. We tend to have human beings who are great at invention or thinking, creativity, and human beings are better at the business dimension. And you rarely get the two in the same space. Go to the next slide, please, Michael. Ask and color, what am I talking about? Why, why steam? In my day job, I look at data analytics, applying visualization and AI to complex data sets, specifically on security. Project names I've given those have been inspired by impressionist painters, Cezanne, Degas, and Monet. Translating data into any meaningful visualization is part science, part storytelling. We need an understanding of color parts to begin with. Light, shadow, um, photography is one of my other passions. Um, all of these mix together within the data science domain to help you create visualizations that tell a story that trans translate that raw binary data into something human beings can understand and appreciate. This is a nice overlap, nice intersection. Are you on, Michael? Right, here's a critical point. There's another key takeaway. Pairing and innovation. I call this the Babbage effect. So, few individuals embody the passion of both true inventor and great business acumen. Um, in my own case, I'm quite good on the inventing side, not too good on the business side, as Michael the test. The truth is you'd need a pair of, in, pair of individuals. Good examples in the Victorian age were Wheatstone and Cook who came up with electric telegraph, the foundation of what we called modern communications, electronic communications. Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs in the Apple case. So Wozniak was the engineer, the great, the great technologist. Jobs was the great business person. Um, another great example of the Victorian age is uh, Charles Babbage. So if you're not familiar, this Victorian engineer from the 1820s, 1830s who created 
tried to create the world's first mechanical computer. So 100 years before the computing age began, this was a Victorian inventor trying to build a mechanical system that would do mathematical computation. And then in the analytical engine, he proposed later real, true, general purpose computation. He burnt through quite a bit of you, you could, British government money trying to build prototypes, none of which ever saw the light of the day. Partly because he, he wasn't the best at communicating his ideas in a bit general sense, in a, in a business sense, to get that investment. So it was a real shame. And if he'd succeeded, it would have transformed the world. So this Babbage example is a great uh, way of communicating how you need to pair to match make between these different kinds of individuals. And currently, we leave this to chance in our institutions, in our universities, in our, in our clusters. This is a random process. We just randomly expect the right two people to meet together and spark. Um, but for creative souls, as the Van Gogh quote uh, piece mentions, creation is about an artistic expression, a creative expression. The economic value is a secondary thought to them. Moving on, Michael. Conscious of time. Moving on to the goals. What are we trying to achieve? Why, why would you want to do any of this? Innovation and productivity. There's been many arguments. Um, so I should say, so this, this webinar is based on a more detailed blog essay that's available on the ZGEM blog website that has a full set of references you can look at more detail. But people are arguing that currently we have a lack of productivity. It's only the past 10, 15 years in the Western world. Productivity is relatively low. Uh, and how do we stimulate it? Because that has historically been one of the measures of whether you're going to make economic progress. Lots of arguments about lack of training, lack of infrastructure, lack of investment. There are many complex arguments made. Fundamentally, you're not benchmarking your innovation on a global scale for the UK's case. If we move on. Apologies, the slides take a little while to move. Right, here's a nice picture of a wave. Why is that there, Robert? In the past 40 years, we've seen that the digital age has been hyper-productive, fundamentally. It's released huge untapped creative potential. Now you have web designers now, graphic arts, digital arts, all kinds of uh, online entertainment, computer games, etc. And a nice example is the computer games industry, where I remember having arguments with my father in the 1990s about why are people wasting so much money in computer games? Why is so much industry going into computer, manufacturing computer games? He couldn't see the potential. And yet from the, from the 2000s onwards, the GPUs, the graphical processor units that were designed to play those old computer games, suddenly became useful in AI. Suddenly people realized that you could use those graphical processor units, GPUs, to do numerical computation for neural networks. So you could build large scale neural networks, the foundation of all modern AI. And so that game playing in the 1990s, drove an entire new industry of the AI world that we're now seeing, and that how transformative that's being. So often there are very unexpected links between one industry, one innovation development, and another. And it can be almost impossible to predict in advance what the one innovation will lead to. Another point for this slide is this process is disruptive, and there's a lot of text on Schumpeter's waves of destruction. Innovation is always disruptive. disruptive. But if we build more diversity into economies, if we build out cities and urban spaces to be more economically diverse, to be structured to it, to encourage diversity and creativity, the spaces you make will be resilient to whatever disruptions taking place, whether they're physical endogenous disruptions or innov more innovation disruptions. A, a diverse economic system is fundamentally robust, fundamentally resilient. It can absorb and channel those disruptions. This is this is what would be transformative if, if we can achieve this. Final slide, Michael. Let's try and summarize it. Apologies, this is a very broad ranging presentation. Um, each of these topics really needs a whole deck in itself or essay in itself. But looking back, one of the things that concerns me in terms of where we are and how we transform from where we are now, we are li basically still living in a Victorian prison in our mindset, in our conceptualization. Because the 18th, 19th centuries gave birth to the industrial age and the field of economics. But it was all wrapped in the language of that age, stability, calculus, control, capital. The language that we use was necessary, but also very rigid and mechanistic, engineering focused. If we look back at that age, it also produced a tsunami of art, music, architecture, 
uh, my favorite being the Impressionists or later on the Nouveau period, the Art Deco period. Very bold organic design and imagery. How can we infuse that artistic spirit into our modern innovation requirements? And the idea of the STEAM education, mixing science, technology, arts, mathematics, crafts into, into our syllabus that we give to students, I think is vital. If we don't do that, especially as we get into an age where AI and automation do start to take away a lot of the more mundane roles, we have to move up that creativity ladder uh, to effectively get beyond the reach of the machines, in effect, to create something that's both enhances human capacity and utilizes our creative potential. In particular, the way we design human settlements, going back to the garage argument, if you don't have a space in which you can be creative, it's extremely difficult to make progress. And if every time you want to be creative, you have to make an argument for the business case, that's also very difficult. The way we, so the UK has something called Innovate UK, which is the way we mix industrial and academic research programs together, which has been very successful. And, but we could do better. We could have more diverse ways of encouraging and mixing the inventive mind, the creative mind with people with more business acumen and business capability. Um, and if we do that, then I think we can tap into the creative impulse in all human beings. I think there's a lot of creative potential and it's not just graduates. It's not just people who've been through university. Lots of people have inventive potential, but it's just not being tapped into. And they tend not to have access to the capital needed to translate the idea to the market. So one of the things I was proposing recently was the idea of a, a concept called, I call the idea bank, where you could have a venture fund that would take in ideas, pre-patent ideas even, file them, and then turn those into a reusable um, resource. Right, I think we'll probably better end at that point in time and move on to questions. Thanks a lot, Mike. Robert, that was absolutely superb and absolutely uh, punctual. I loved it. Um, <laughs> we've also got quite a few questions for discussion. Uh, there were a number of things you said that uh, I found interesting as well. Uh, like one of the one of the things I think you might have left out, I'm reading a, a book at the moment on the, the foundations of chemistry, uh, was the laboratory itself. Many labs themselves were actually quite cooperative areas and very chaotic and disordered, particularly as you look at some of the very early photographs of them. They, and this mm -hmm. is when they're getting themselves dressed up to look good and they're still yeah. uh, chaotic. Um, the other thing I liked is, you know, order is death. My, uh, my, my family motto is actually order ex chaos, order from chaos. But the important thing is to have some chaos, uh, is there. Uh, so we've got a lot of questions here. Uh, just to bring it back to a point of detail, if you don't mind, a couple of people, uh, especially Matthew Leach, who's normally very good at these, just wanted you to quickly, uh, recap on the, uh, this slide here on economic complexity index uh, versus income. Uh, Matthew's point being uh, really that it, it, it would appear that there was an inverse relationship here uh, between um, was, was Matthew's comment. Uh, yeah, it's very. It looked like GDP was inversely proportional to ECI. No, so that the y-axis is mean income, not GDP, and the horizontal axis is the ECI measure. So where one, close to zero is a high ECI measure, 100, 100 is a low ECI measure. It's an inverted scale. Um, and also, this is a very subsample distribution. So if you put in most uh, developed states, you will get much more of a log normal distribution. I was interested, in this case, I was particularly interested in the ASEAN region and whether there's a difference in their development cycle versus um, other developed regions. Um, that's why I was experimenting with that particular plot uh, function. Great. Yeah, just, just there. And folks, just a reminder that both the slides and uh, some of the references are on the website. Mm -hmm. um, I was also uh, very yeah, pleased. Nice. There's a blog on the website as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I was also very pleased to see the mention of Buckminster Fuller, very much the Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century, in my opinion, too. So I'm uh, very good there. Let's, let's, let's get on to this. There's quite a few questions related really to this tension between organization, chaos, and, and order. Um, so I'm just going to leap in here. Uh, mm -hmm. David Lansman says, isn't planning for innovation the problem? The kind of structures which are used for planning create perverse incentives and encourage bureaucratic rent seeking. For real innovation, shouldn't planners just get out of the way? <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> Short answer to that. Um, okay. 
Well, okay, now, we, 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 don't have, we don't have the opposite point of view. Douglas Andrews says, uh, Dr. Haircock has failed to mention the most important catalyst to scientific innovation since the mid 20th century, i.e. government spending. So most American inventions of the past 80 years have resulted from massive spending uh, by the Defense Department and the National Institutes of Health. Today, there is practically no basic research I'll, contributing I'll, to the development of new medicines outside of the NIH. I'll, I'll happily jump in on this one. So I've been looking at some quite detailed research on cluster formation recently, and quite correct. In many cases, it's been significant government investment over a long time period. So MIT certainly falls in that category, or San Diego in the U.S. with the U.S. Navy labs, say military spend for an extended period of time. Um, in the U.K., we had DERA that Michael's familiar with. Um, so it is the case that sometimes you need government spending over a long time period in a particular region to start to develop it and create the possibility for clusters to start to form. Um, it's certainly a very topic of debate about whether that's a you know, in wholly positive thing, or you'd be better off with more commercially driven innovation. But often it depends. Certainly, for, it's certainly true that the, the government investment has been necessary for blue sky development. Companies that tend still tend to be quite wary of the blue sky realm. Um, and for, and if you want transformation, of course, that's where your transformation is going to come from. It's blue sky, not the short term stuff. Well, I must say, you know, there's been a lot written on this. And these are two opposing points of view. Of course, you've got Mary, Mariana Mazzucato's uh, work mm -hmm. on the entrepreneurial state. Um, I, I tend to look at it in the notion of uh, competition within a framework, personally. So we have a Terence Keeley wrote in the mid-90s a book called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. And in that, he actually pointed out that government spending on its own research displaced private spending as a multiple. This didn't mean government spending was a bad thing, though. It was just that if you, if you look at DARPA, uh, its heyday, and it had a real nadir uh, in the 90s, but its heyday in the 70s and 80s when it was, was when it dished out the money competitively. Its nadir was when it did it itself, and it went back to uh, trials and tests and mm -hmm. challenges. Uh, so I think, I think the challenge model works because you're, you're, yeah. you're increasing disorder by yeah. you know creating these challenges, but when you try and do it yourself, is there? And this mm -hmm. I think leads to a very peculiar view of, of what type of government spending works and what doesn't. I, I think a critical thing for me, DARPA is interesting. I think DARPA, the secret was the program managers. The program managers had a lot of autonomy. Um, I know the UK is looking at the, a new ARPA model for the UK mm -hmm. to try and replicate that that uh, DARPA process. I think it's really going to go down to how you architect. The responsibility and the capacity, the empowerment of the individuals leading those programs. Um, because going back to my original point, one of the, the points, if you, the innovative mind can see things that by definition others are not seeing. Yeah. So it's therefore very difficult to communicate to people what your vision is. Um, and if especially the more longer term, the more blue sky that vision is, the harder it becomes. So there has to be a degree of trust. I, Again, going back to the Babbage example, yeah, Babbage was government funded. Babbage received about seventeen thousand pounds, the equivalent of building a warship in you know, equivalent currency terms. A huge amount of money was invested in his program, um, and it got to the point where eventually he went to government, and they they were just burnt out. They couldn't understand why they should keep investing something, um, and also he wasn't the easiest person to communicate with. Um, but yeah, so the higher the risk, this higher longer term innovation definitely is tends to be government funded and it's probably going to remain the case in the future. Well, also, of course, you know, Babbage ultimately was effectively a dead end. It's an historical interest, but a better example might be Harrison and the chronometer, which was a competition. Uh -huh. Good, um, good. Yeah. Now, um, Shan Turnbull is uh, here making up words. Uh, I'm teasing him. Uh, he's, he's actually asking, what might you think of nurturing innovation the way nature does by introducing into organizations uh, the dynamic dualism? Uh, the cell biologist, um, sorry, cell biologist Donald Ingber describes as the architecture of life. Um, I believe it as well that but Mr. Fuller created a word tensegrity, combining uh, yeah. words That's tension and integrity. Yeah. Yes. Hierarchical organizations that dominate our society deny the existence of tensegrity and a dual yin and yang relationship. Uh, Shan has also got a number of other uh, comments about another word called chaotic, 
which uh, the <laughs> chap who's behind Visa uh, described as the way Visa really works. Uh, and the, and Shan contends that chaotic is the same thing as tensegrity. And Shan, I've got enough now, okay? But uh, anyway, back, back to back to Shan's question: uh, How do we get this dynamic dualism? Good, good point. I think a nice example here is um, Skunk Works. So you look at the original Lockheed Martin Skunk Works program. Why does the company do that? So you have a large enterprise that has all the resources, has lots of money, but they set up a isolated innovation center within their company that's literally completely isolated from the rest of the company and operates like that with just a single executive line of control and gets the resources it needs. Why would you do this? It seems, especially in an age of communicate networks and communication, our obsession with group group dynamics, why would you isolate a part of your organization? And the answer is because if you don't, the rest of the organization will kill it. It will be treated as a cancer. And for any established company, getting innovation running, of course, we have you know, things like the Kodak example, where a company just doesn't see the innovation potential is you know, the potential of its own innovation even. Um, so I've seen many examples of skull marks operating in large organizations, large companies, where you have this te this tension, inherent tension between an established business model and a disruptive business model. And um, as the executive, you need to protect that new disruptive business model, even though you know it's going to cause pain. And this goes in kind of I think it goes into the ten segregated question, because then you have this inherent put ten segregated tension inside your Net, the network system that is your entire enterprise, um, and then how you spin up that that the output of that skunk works and reintegrate it back into your organization is an entirely different process and model in itself. Um, good question. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, tackle the A bit, the uh, the arts. Uh, we've got a few comments here. Uh, Tim Coleman finds the STEAM acronym helpful. Um, Tim, it, it's been around a little bit, but uh, he's yeah, interested. I didn't <laughs> One of the major blockers. Uh, uh, Rhonda Oka is also very, very interested in, uh, in in how how we get this innovation going. But what she's interested in, and I think she's got a really good point here. Where do we start? Uh, it's easy to say it's everything: uh, governments, uh, grassroots movements, business, artists, scientists, and that would be good. Um, but is is there a specific point to start? And I might point out to many people out there that this is not new in uh, a new discussion in areas where people talk about cities. In fact, the Lord Mayor this year, his program is Global Britain Trade Innovation Culture, uh, the, the culture being the A in STEAM. So he's lots of people are beginning to realize that innovation is not uh, not, not strictly lab based or science based. It needs a multidisciplinary approach. But to, where would you start? A nice example, I think, is something like um, South Korea. So we tend to think South Korea is this heavy industrial nation, produces ships and cars and you know, manufactured goods and TVs. And yet one of their great innovative outputs of the past decade is K-pop and music and Korean food and Korean culture. Um, so they, they've successfully transitioned to an entirely new creative industrial output and doing it very well and very successfully. Um, which would have been wholly surprising 20 years ago um, to, to many uh, on, onlookers. So how did they do that? It's worth looking at the, the model, the cultural model they used to go down that route and develop that kind of output. And it, so I agree with you, Michael. It's, this is not about necessarily just creating a new business lab or a new you know, IBM lab or something. This is about how you tap into culture, tap into people's inherent creative potential in a broad way. Um, and, and, and go back to my garage argument. It's this is a problem. It's how we facilitate and make available that kind of free creative space in which people can make things and break things. Um, and that's a challenge. And, and I think it's a multiplicity of spaces. So Hugh Purser uh, says the point about free garage space resonates. Perhaps a big opportunity at local level would be to open up empty retail space in town centers. To innovative yep. activity, as you pointed out, free from business tax, low, no rent. Um, you know, in the US, they have these spaces are pretty much that. So you have street corner place you can go in and do some laser welding or 3D printing or whatever. Could you contrast that though with? Uh, I mean, WeWork was obviously a, a big. It wasn't this going to be the place? But you, you, you seem to not find the WeWork or Regus model interesting. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. The, the WeWork uh, idea that people would uh, take the kind of the the managed office services 
approach, uh, but would then meet together um, around. Okay. Uh, Part of the problem is we have a current obsession with digital technologies, and and basically you can run a you know a software house from a bedroom. Yep. So I can run a medium sized you know cloud software space from my bedroom. I don't need that much physical space. That's fine, but you know ultimately that that road is going to run out, and we have to get back to a broader, innovative, creating, making, doing things for human beings. Um, so if I want large woodwork machines. My bedroom is not the suitable place to do it, <laughs> um, or an office mm. space, or you know, if I want. So if I want a Tesla grade space where I can use high voltage equipment at a million volts, because um, it's pretty. Um, you know, where do I get that? How do I do that? Um, and we go back to this point of how do we mix together the business interests and the, the need for capital investment with creative potential. So there's, there's, there's several challenges we, we're just not addressing, and and government is still just making it a random. They, they go back to the cluster concept. So the idea is that the cluster will fix that if we create the right cluster, then the right people will just meet in that cluster, and it'll all happen. Uh, and since we don't know how to make clusters, that's a problem. A few things here. Uh, Paul Barnett points out the Cockpit Arts in London is a good example of a creative arts incubator. You person has pointed out uh, that uh, apparently there, there's a new uh, Korean uh, startup uh, center that's opened in Singapore. Uh, quite <laughs> interesting. Uh, so, so things there. Um, now, I'd just like to pick up um, Matthew Leach and Paul Barnett have got some related points um, here. Uh, Paul, Paul points out that the former CEO of the Silicon Valley Tech Accelerator, SRI, uh, says the problem starts at the start. Uh, there's no focus on value creation, no real need being addressed. Uh, Matthew Leach points out you need a bit of spare time, space, and energy to make changes. You know, if you're maximizing everything, you need to optimize your space, your diary, uh, you're not going to really uh, go go anywhere. Um, that's tough. Um, that, 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 yeah, if, so in the book, I the book I produced on cohesion and, and like one of the takers I'd want to take away from this set would be space. Going back to the metaphor that I started with, but space in the sense that creativity needs space and in terms of time and resource and with no, with no, you know, price tag attached. And, and it's how you do that. So, um, and there's, the question comes then goes into trust. How do you trust that you've got the right people? Who are just not wasting resource, but actually doing something creative. Um, well, I spent a few years on the City of London's Planning uh, and Transportation Committee, and one of the things we were pushing very hard for, with some success, I guess, <clears throat> was the use that when somebody came in a large development, there was some shared workspaces in it, uh, even if they had a, a primary tenant. Um, and I think I would, I once put forward a proposal myself for a Kind of a four-way. I called it the rabbit hutch. <laughs> how, how did you, how did you get this very flexible space? It could be all sorts of things: a coffee shop, a laboratory, yeah. a shared yeah. workspace, uh, etc. Um, just time for a couple more. I'll squeeze them in if it's not too bad. And Hughes also pointed out that maybe Sweden and Finland now have some Korean accelerators. But um, uh, Tan, 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 Tan Morgan would like to know: um, Will COVID nineteen speed up disruption and innovation? Yes. Kind of, well, I'm also kind of interested because if you look at what's been going on in America, the money has been given directly to the individuals, whereas in Europe we've given it to the companies or through the companies through furloughing. Um, and I, I obviously have a, a lot of uh, contact with America. A lot of people are turning their minds to what they can do. This has been a great liberating factor uh, because they don't know what they're going to do when it dries up, which is uh, sometime the end of this month. Um, so, <laughs> whereas over here, I think a lot of people are kind of sitting around waiting till work starts again or does it, and then they'll see what they do. Now, pandemics in the past, like the Black Death in Europe, were definitely transformative and can be argued led to greater social and economic development. Of course, that's a <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of comments are coming in thanking you uh, for a fascinating talk. So, but I don't have time to read them. But I'd like <laughs> to just squeeze one thing in, if you wouldn't mind, before we close. Uh, Stephen Murgatroyd wouldn't mind a one-minute sketch of how you compare the U.S., Europe, and China in innovation terms. Ah, good point. Um, very, very interesting. I've just been analyzing the number of patents produced by different countries. 
Um, and if you look at China, they are doing amazingly well. So people talk about historically China taking IPR. No, China is producing vast amounts of IPR of its own now since the 2005, 2007 period. So China is now leading in IPR development. So there's been a huge transformation just the past 10, 15 years in that country's capability in IPR. They've really got the we need patents message. Um, apart from that, again, go back to benchmarking. In Europe, I, I don't think people are really benchmark, benchmarking their patent production on a global scale. The mm. U.S., I, <clears throat> historically, I, st I still think, you know, I spent a lot of time in the U.S., in Boston, at the Media Labs, place like that. They are fabulously inventive. I, I give it to the Americans. They can really invent and be creative. And are willing to take that, also just willing to take the risk. I'm willing to make that investment in something crazy, something different. Well, Robert, we've run to the end of time. Um, and uh, people would hang on. I do have an interesting announcement for the crowd. Uh, but firstly, uh, three rounds of thanks. Uh, big thanks to our sponsors. Many of them, obviously, is technology firms interested in innovation, and many of them is finance firms interested in finding ways of funding it and using innovation. So uh, hopefully very, very helpful. I think your points about complexity is, is the interesting one. And, of course, that constant tension between order and chaos, simplicity and complexity uh, keeps rising uh, in all of these conversations. Um, the, the point I might like to make to everybody is that tomorrow morning at 8.30, if this subject interested you, we, as Zien, have a webinar at 8.30 on uh, our Smart Centers Index. And many of you who've delved into our indices over the years will know that for well over 15 years, we've been using a biodiversity measurement model for all of them. So very much in line with uh, Robert's thinking. So we, uh, we, we use various biodiversity measures uh, to, to look at complexity and they, co they comprise a, a fairly important element of the model. Um, we then uh, have a, another look, and I think just as interesting is invention is not uh, a sole, uh, sole entrepreneur's thing, as, as Robert pointed out. It starts with a duo, uh, and we're going to be looking at employee share plans and other ways of involving employees uh, together. And finally, uh, for those of you of a, of a legal bent, we have a fascinating session on Friday on portfolio protection and securities class actions, so an area that I, I find uh, enormously fascinating. Uh, although I, I sometimes wonder uh, if, if bringing lawyers as a competitive model is the way I really want to go. Anyhow, uh, a week, uh, the rest of this week features many other webinars, hopefully uh, almost as good as yours today, Robert. That would be very good. And it turns to me uh, to say thank you to you, of course. Uh, and to do so, I happen to have an applause meter here, uh, which I'm unable to open up the applause to everybody. But fortunately, uh, this comes from Korea. Uh, so thanks for all the comments on Korea, Hugh. And uh, thank you on behalf of the entire audience. Uh, Very creative, Michael. Uh, we try. Uh, anyway, Robert, thanks so much. Really appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Take care.